All right, all right, all right. The summer break is upon us. And we have once again arrived at that point where I pretend to know Will. Same as last year and the year before that and the year before that. I think we're going to take stock of the opening 12 races in what has been a gloriously competitive season of Formula One and grade the drivers on just how good or terrible they have been thus far, grading them from A to F. You know, same old stuff. We're going to do this in ascending order of where they are in the driver's standings. Sort of. We're so accustomed to seeing an unfairly talented Dutchman in an unfairly fast Red Bull finishing at the top of the pile all the time this year. So it would be kind of nice that this list does not start off with that Dutchman but rather with another Dutchman. One that hasn't quite had the same amount of success. What started out with so much promise ended up in a miserable puddle on the floor. Nick De Vries was dropped by Dr. Helmut Marco in just 10 races in a speed run that nobody celebrated. When you're dropped in 10 races, yet someone like Scott Speed was kept on for a year and a half, that does kind of tell you how well this whole ordeal went. There's no use beating around the bush here. It was not a good campaign in any stretch of the imagination. Sure, he wasn't given enough time, but there was no indication it was going to get any better as the season went on. The occasional out-qualifying of his teammate doesn't necessarily make one the bee's knees in this game, even if you do come in as a world champion across multiple disciplines like he did. Of course, we'll never know if he would have fulfilled his potential. It was a brutal axing, and this is a bit of a brutal rating, but it kinda has to be, considering his replacement did a little bit better when he was brought into the fold. When news broke that Daniel Ricciardo was returning to the Formula 1 grid, the whole world leapt to their feet in celebration. The Honey Badger is back, ready to kick up and take names. It, it is a little bit difficult to do that in a car that has less balls than a eunuch, but he did beat his teammate on his first time out. And oh boy, not even Marco's nitpicking post-race could dampen the spirits on the performance by the greatest Australian driver to ever be called Daniel. Spa wasn't totally convincing, but he did at least avoid the temptation to throw himself into the barrier, which is a plus when given thought. It may have only been two races, but with the task set before him to perform like he did, it's only fair that he gets a rating like this. And it's also only fair that Logan Sargent doesn't get a rating like this. All the way through the junior ranks, this dude had an unusual capacity for suddenly becoming an absolute speed demon whenever the championship that he was racing in turned up to Silverstone. So obviously come the British Grand Prix, I was expecting this lad to take pole position and win the race by 89 laps, but that didn't happen. In fact, it wasn't even close. His performance there was akin to what it had been for most of the year, which was disappointing. He has shown glimpses of speed here and there. His problem, however, is stringing everything together, which is understandable. These cars are quite fast, and corners tend to come at you faster than life does. He is the type of driver that just needs a little bit more time than others, and he would come good. But exactly how much time are Williams willing to afford him? And with other drivers lurking around, that could add to Williams' desperate struggle to recoup the glory days of the 80s and the 90s. Sargent needs a strong second half of the season if he's going to convince the world that he's a better driver than, say, Kevin Magnussen? Although that dude hasn't been amazingly flash lately either. For a dude who last year drove many a Viking effort, he's almost gone out of his way to completely disappear this year. It's not as if he's caused Haas any particular problem, it's just that at times you kind of forget that he's on the grid at all and has instead wound up on Gardner's Island, which completely boggles the mind. It's not very often that Magnussen is even in the same postcode as his teammate in qualifying. His race pace as a whole may not be bad, but when your only real competition in this game is your teammate and the only high highlights from the team generally come from said teammates. It doesn't bode well for years. K-Mag really needs to up his game heading into Zandvoort because there are others out there who will want the drive, who could pay for the drive and would be worthy of the drive. Of course, replacing one with a rookie doesn't always work. Sometimes it does take time, like it did with Yuki Tsunoda, another driver who was in desperate need of impressing the Sith Lord of the Formula 1 paddock. Tsunoda's season has been a mixed bag so far. On one hand, he triumphed over one of the greatest prospects to come out of the go-karting scene since humans started racing motorized tin trays. On the other hand, he has had his moments where his brain vacated him. Not that they're common enough to make us start thinking about him getting the boot from Alpha Tauri, or whatever they're going to be called from next season. The Red Bull seat may just be beyond reach for him, but he's done enough so far to justify remaining in the sport for at least a little while longer, provided he can keep his experienced teammate honest for the remainder of the year. The same almost applies to Joe Guan Yu. 
almost since his debut last year. Rather than stagnating in a mirage of bottom five results, garnished with the occasional 15th placing, Joe is more than proving his worth at Sauber. He's certainly not been left for dead by his teammate, but if you were to take things at face value, he is losing the battle to him in qualifying and in the race. Looking into the results, the margin is nowhere near bad enough to have the Swiss bosses look at replacing him. However, if he's to remain at Sauber in the years where it's set to become Audi, he'll most likely have to improve upon what he's done. Because yes, it has been good. You can definitely see the potential there. And some of those performances this year have been very impressive, such as in Hungary, where he qualified on P5. But it's not as if he's beating his teammate very often. And with the wealth of drivers trying to break into the series, and others with better results moping around trying to stay in it, Joe will need to search for that little bit extra to distinguish himself as someone who, without question, belongs on the Formula 1 grid. A good place to start is to consistently beat his teammate, Valtteri Bottas. Ah yes, good old Valtteri. It's quite hard to write up a review for this lad, because apart from hitting all the marks that he needs to, he's been about as unspectacular as a rainy day in Scotland. I'm not sure what people were expecting of Bottas this year, but he has been winning the teammate battle against Joe, so his place in the team is beyond question, but... I don't know. I guess there are some other drivers out there that I would rather see in his place. Because I am a vindictive bastard like that. Because aside from his overwhelming urge to share his cheeks with his peeps, there's not much he's doing wrong. He is winning the qualifying battle. He has, at most, outraced his teammates. And he hasn't played hooky with the team's no claims bonus. He's just... The boring choice, I guess. A little like Nico Hülkenberg. Or at least that was the attitude when it was announced that he would be replacing Mick Schumacher for the 2023 season. Do Haas really think that they're gonna get much better results out of this old, washed up, has been with a phobia of podiums? Well, the first round in Bahrain arrived, and that's when fans all around the world were reminded of who Nico Hülkenberg actually was. A really f***ing quick driver. And it turned out that Haas had made a really good purchase. A constant presence in Q3, with his performance in Canada being a real eye-opener. I don't care about any grid penalty. Mans deserves his props. He came violently close to his maiden podium in Melbourne, but... <laughs> Of course. Ain't no way the motor racing gods are going to allow this can to take the trip upstairs. Not then. Not ever. So why then am I not about to say that this lad is the greatest thing since sliced bread? Well, come the race time, Hulk just disappears. Some of that is almost certainly down to the car, but we don't have time for rational thinking on this channel. Either way, however, this has been a very good year thus far for Nico Hülkenberg. He certainly has been the MVP of his team, and Alex Albon is the MVP of his. The same way that Luka Doncic is carrying the maps, Alexander Albon is carrying Williams. That may seem bitterly unfair, but considering how big the gaps are to his teammate in qualifying, it's about as fair and civil as I'm gonna get on the matter. Aside from his somewhat unhealthy excursion into the sandbox in Melbourne, Albon this year has been freaking amazing, demonstrating a lot of what he can do with some very good qualifying results and even better race results. Williams still aren't out of their rut, no, but Albon is extracting about as much as he can out of it and that's all you could really ask of him and it's no surprise that he has been linked to the likes of Ferrari because his place in Formula 1 right now is beyond question. To go from an Alpha Tauri seat to Red Bull to drown at Red Bull, then recede back to a lesser team and then to prove his worth as a comeback worthy of praise, it's pretty much what Pierre Gasly did too. It's why he got that new gig at Alpine. A French driver at a French team is a recipe for disaster on its own. Throw in a French teammate and you have the ingredients for a civil war. That has happened on occasion this year. But for the most part, the drivers have instead been performing well enough whenever it didn't do that most French of things and set the nearest car on fire, a la Baku. The main question we want to ask, however, is Pierre Gasly delivering the goods this year? Well, considering that he's about even with his teammate in the qualifying battle, that's got to count for something. He's definitely had some good moments this year, such as the podium placing in the Spa Sprint Race. And he has been a constant presence in the points. In more than enough races, he has been ahead of his teammate by the time the chicken flag had fallen. It's not all the time, however. It is quite hard to get the upper hand on Esteban Ocon. Many a driver have tried, and many a time has resulted in a few choice words of Spanish being used that the engineers politely pretend not to understand. This year at Alpine, Ocon Ocon is leading the way as the more experienced driver of the two. You would think that this would spell out consistency, but his consistency this year really has been like mashed potatoes. Some bits are lumpy as hell. Not all of it has been his fault, but some mistakes have been needless. His podium in Monaco, however, deserves every bit of plaudit that it does. A great performance that's been the high point of the season thus far for Alpine, and with the team imploding from within managerially, will probably be the high point of the entire season. Unless the second half of the season throws us a Mickey mouse race and the walls of the track echo to the sound of the songs of angry men. May 
maybe Monza can give them that, like it did back in 2021, when McLaren broke through for their first win in almost 10 years. Actually, that team has been storming this year, in no small part thanks to the drivers, in no small part thanks to Oscar Pastry. Heading into the season, I made the prediction that Oscar Piastri would either fail to live up to the hype and become a bust, or would exceed expectations and show the entire world that he was as good as Formula Regional, Formula 3 and Formula 2 indicated. Guess which one he did? Uh, yeah, the second one. The good one. Although it wasn't immediate, Piastri has definitely emerged as one of the surprises this year with a stellar run of form. When McLaren decided to wake up once they ventured back to the British Isles, people were getting a better look into how he was progressing in his rookie year. What we began seeing was that, despite still being a little bit green and up against a stonking fast teammate, he was holding his own. His performances were damn solid. In qualifying and in the race, you get the sense that this dude is almost bulletproof when it comes to any form of pressure. All eyes were on him after the events of last year. He we are 12 months later and, especially with the last 3 or 4 Grand Prix, almost no one is questioning McLaren's decision to hire him. He's been a standout this far, and there's surely more to come. It's funny, because in his rookie year, Lando Norris wasn't quite as lauded, yet in the year 2023, he's one of the hottest commodities. No, no, wait, that's not what I meant. Lando been linked to virtually any team on the grid with a brain, pen, and sheet of paper tells you enough about what type of form he's in right now. Very fast, very good. Even at the start of the year, when the MCL 60 was slower than a dog in a rug, Lando was still putting in some exceptional drives. And that's the power of these types of drivers. Those exceptional ones, the ones that stand out. Even with crap cars, they could still make themselves noticeable. Drives such as in Melbourne, where he climbed through the field served as proof that if McLaren can get their act together, he can start challenging for wins, at least whenever the RB19 takes a day off. Sure, the last few races have been great for the team, and for Lando, we are noticing his performances a little bit more, but all of this season, not just the last three or four races, he has been proving his worth. There is a very good reason why everybody is chasing his signature. There's also a very good reason why nobody is chasing Lance Stroll's one. So Lancelot has to be one of the most frustrating drivers on the entire grid. There are brief glimpses of potential where you could see him hoisting another trophy above his head, but more often than not, you see him trailing down the grid whilst his teammate is up ahead and getting the lion's share of the team's points. Some of the performances this year have been flat out bad. Yeah, I know who his teammate is, but if you have a guaranteed place in this sport, at least act like you can hang every four or five races. His pace is fine, I guess? But that's definitely not enough. His Formula 1 career has been going on for longer than most already. He's been with this particular team since 2019. There's not a lot of excuse left. Although, I'm not sure Big Daddy has the same opinion. It seems to him that they're about even Stevens, but <laughs> they're not. They're not. You might be able to argue that with Ferrari, but even that's a can of worms. Exhibit A being the opening race in Bahrain, where the engine in Charles Leclerc's car did that most Italian of things, destroying itself with an air shot of a good result. Leclerc's performance this year so far has been checkered. We've seen his pace. Oh boy, we've seen his pace. He's fast. Really damn fast. But he has got an unhealthy record of spinning off at high speed into the barriers, which is not ideal. His results aren't helped with Ferrari's futile attempts to understand basic strategic calls, or pit stops, or common sense, or even its own existence. But as mentioned before, he doesn't help himself sometimes. Twice this year, he has been on pole position. One of them may have been by default, but so what? He's also the only Ferrari driver to get onto the podium, three times in fact. But while this is all very flattering, it's not as if Carlos Sainz has been a complete dud this year, although his lack of awareness sometimes doesn't make him popular outside of Madrid. As of now, it appears that Carlos Sainz's tenure at Ferrari is nearing the end. Although, not for lack of performance, the battle between he and Leclerc is closer than many would like to believe or care to admit. He has shown his speed this year and whatever he's doing to avoid any Ferrariisms in that team, it's working. However, he is in a losing effort in the qualifying battle and he hasn't stood on the podium thus far this year. It seems he lacks that little bit extra that Charles possesses and thus, while the results have been very good, they haven't been exceptional. Really, both Ferrari drivers have had their faults this year, but if anyone can make sense of the mess at Ferrari, George Russell probably isn't the guy because right now, he's in a mess of his own. One of the biggest lies told last year was that Russell was destroying his teammate. 
He wasn't. He never was. What he did do was run mighty close to him and was a much more worthy adversary than what Captain Buttcheeks was in his entire run at Brackley. This year, it was expected that he would build upon that and to help take Mercedes back to the promised land, where winning 35 out of the 22 races that year would be good enough. Instead, though, he has struggled. Struggled to get his head around the car, and especially so after the updates. You can chalk that up to any number of things, but excuses were not extended to his teammate this time last year, and they won't be extended here either. You've got to be able to adapt in this game and right now, he's lacking that 3 to 4 tenths needed to bridge the gap to his teammates. And silly errors like in Montreal did not make him look like a million bucks. It's been a disappointing year for him so far. But despite the soul searching that Mercedes has gone through in the past 18 months, with the poor buggers having to scrape through with podiums and the occasional win, they do still have Sir Lewis Hamilton. The boy from Stevenage still reckons he's got a few good years left in him in the top flight of motorsport. And yeah, I do believe him, because so far this year, he showed no signs of slowing down. It seems that, despite the Merc not being a rocket ship, and thus not to his liking, he's still putting in some storming drives. Almost every single time he goes out on track, his pole position in Hungary wasn't really a return to form, because he's had form for the entire year, and he's extracting the most he can out of that Merc, much more so than his teammate who apparently destroyed him last year. There's not much he could say about his performances other than, this is Sir Lewis Hamilton. This is why he's as lauded as he is. Because you know damn well that that Merc can't really be maxed any more than it is right now by him. Sure, he hasn't won a race this year, but it's not just about winning in Formula 1. It's about performing with what you have, and right now, you'd either have to be blind or stupid to find much fault with him. Ditto 2 for Fernando Alonso. For 89,000 years, Alonso has been beset with rubbish team switches and even more rubbish cars once he signed the dotted line. For once, it would be nice if the Lord of the Eyebrows could have a car that functioned properly and hold itself together long enough so that it can get to the finish line as well. This year, Aston delivers, and oh boy, it was beautiful to see Fernando vying for podiums on a consistent basis, seeing just how damn good he is behind the wheel. That was before the team lost its way around 10 races in. To say he's been the better driver at Aston Martin this year would be a grave understatement. This is the Fernando Alonso we all know and love. A legend of the sport. Someone whose stats do no justice. And someone who should be winning more. Someone else who should be winning more is Sergio Perez, but for very different reasons. Red Bull knew exactly who they were hiring at the tail end of 2020. Checo was putting in some incredible drives in the racing point, including a win in the Saka Grand Prix, where he climbed up through the field and achieved the impossible. Viva la Mercedes Netflix curse. Since coming in, he has shown morsels of potential, and at the start of the year, he had been mooted as a championship rival to his teammates. But then, he was reined in. Which, fair enough, his teammate is an inconceivably talented monster. However, what is expected of him, in a car that's so strong, is that he picks up those podium positions and doesn't get knocked out before Q3. So far, he has struggled to do that, which suggests two things. That either the Red Bull is a tractor, which I struggle to believe, or that Checo himself is struggling. If the latter is the case, that's the last thing that Red Bull needs if they turn up to 2024 and a rival team has got their shit together. We know what Checo can do. Red Bull knows what he can do. He knows what he can do. He knows that he knows what he could do, therefore should do what he knows. He needs to rekindle that fast, because Dr. Helmut Marco has got quite an itchy foot right now. Right now, his teammate, Max. The one thing I keep on hearing about this season is about how strong the Red Bull is, how much of a rocket ship it is, and how boring the season is. Something that needs to be said more, however, is just how goddamn good Max has been lately. Sorry, Richard Bradley. Yeah, he's always been good, but he's just been a complete robot this year. You can have this guy start a race when it's finished and he'll still find a way to win. Such precision, such speed, such perfection. Yeah, the car's good, but... Bruh, it's kind of hard to be mad at his winning. You kind of have to sit back and admire the performances. Sure, it's not exactly exciting, but all of the dominant seasons of Formula 1 never are exciting, aren't they? One day, it will stop. All dominant streaks do. But for the time being, like all those other times, just appreciate the greatness that we are witnessing unfold before our eyes. Provided he doesn't keep on stepping on his own dick over the radio. So that's where I reckon they're all at right now. Will any of this change in the second half of the year? Well, we'll see.